gospel. Uh, Nick Loris joins us. He is, um, uh, well, Nick, you're one of those guys that has such a long resume. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Vice President of Public Policy at C3 Solutions. Uh, and uh, we're talking this morning about gas prices and, and whether whether this thing is too far out of the uh, out of the bottle that we can ever get it back in. Uh, Nick, uh, the gas prices are just crazy high all across America right now, all across the world. And uh, we're wondering if there's anything we can do about it because uh, it just seems as if it's, it's beyond our control. Is that the case? Yeah, in a lot of respects it is. Uh, because oil is a globally traded commodity and makes up you know, more than half the price of a gallon, gallon. What happens is from no, our no. standpoint, but also from a demand standpoint, impacts the price of the pump in the U.S. And even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, prices steadily increasing as demand was outpacing supply as countries were economic restraints and people were traveling. A number of little regulatory tweaks we could make to save a few cents here and there, which you know any any little bit helps. Uh, but in some respects. Uh, because of the global nature of the the marketplace, it, it is difficult to just kind of flip a switch and, and have prices be to comfortable levels for American drivers. Well, we have talked in the past about uh, the difficulties of uh, getting gasoline to the pumps. Uh, and, you know, we, we talk about getting it from the pump into our cars, but just getting it to the pumps is, is quite a process. Um, and it starts with getting it out of the ground. And and that obviously is a major problem right now for America. Is it uh, as simple as simply saying, let's pump more? Uh, I wish it were. You know, it, it's challenging both from an economic standpoint because you know, when COVID hit, you know, a lot of these companies you know, lost their shirts because demand just tanked. And if you remember, oil prices briefly went negative for a period in 2020. And so a lot of companies lost a lot of money. And as prices increased, like they're trying to make their balance sheets right and, and give banks and investors confidence that they can go out and, and extract more resources. Uh, and then it takes time to actually drill the exploratory wells to know where the oil is um, to make sure they can get it out of the ground and deliver it to the places where it needs to go. And so all of that takes time as well. You are seeing increases in places like the Permian Basin in Texas where they have a lot of infrastructure already. And so that's going to make up a lot of the supply increase throughout year and and by early next year we should be up above pre-pandemic levels for u.s production um but it does take time especially if you're you're starting from scratch yeah and canada says that we've got plenty we'll send you some but that's a problem too isn't it yeah and that's one of the frustrations that dates back to the obama administration is the fact that we don't have the keystone xl pipeline built which would have delivered uh, up to 830,000 barrels of oil per day down to Gulf Coast refineries. And, you know, they, the company who wanted to build Keystone XL first applied for that p- permit back in 2008. Uh, and here it is uh, 14 years later, and we still don't have that pipeline. Uh, and the Obama administration concluded on multiple occasions that the pipeline would be environmentally safe, that it wouldn't contribute to climate change, uh, and yet because of litigious anti uh, oil activists. We still don't have that pipeline. And, you know, the Biden administration uh, similarly is catering to them. And, and on day one, it nicks the, the permit for the pipeline. Yeah, that is that's a major problem for us, because as as certainly guys like Kilmeade and, and Hannity point out, uh, we were um, on the verge of, if not already being an exporter of energy to now we're begging other countries to, to send us oil. And uh, there's some question as to whether or not we actually want them to. Uh, Policy-wise, uh, that's one thing. But then uh, you mentioned infrastructure, and uh, and we were talking about the crude itself and getting it here. Refineries are another problem in this whole formula, aren't they? Yeah, we could fan refining capacity. Uh, you know, the refiners in the Gulf Coast made about a hundred billion dollars of investment before the shale revolution to refine the heavier crudes that come from places like Canada. Uh, and so that's why not having that, that supply um, hurts us. Uh, but then there's also a number of regulatory uh, decisions that uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and others have put in place that increases the cost of refining 
um, not to mention the ethanol mandate that requires that we blend corn ethanol into our fuel supply is an additional cost, especially for our smaller refiners. And so those costs are then passed on to consumers. So yes, you know, refining is a, a big aspect of the, the price of a gallon of gasoline too. Being between that and federal and state taxes, you know, they make up number two and number three of the cost of retail gasoline. So it, the more we can ease the regulations on refiners while still maintaining environmental safeguards, uh, the, the better off we're going to be for domestic refining capabilities, but also for American consumers and drivers. Nick is a senior advisor on energy and environment at Madras uh, LLC, and he serves on, as well, policy advisory boards at Conserve America and the American Conservation Coalition. Nick, um, what can we do? How does how does the government get us out of this uh, this quandary? Yeah, the you know, would be to fix some of these regular... Uh, we're losing you there. Can you hear me on now? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, they could make a number of regulatory tw- tweaks now to uh, help the pain at the pump a little bit, but then also signal to American energy producers that America is open for business, that we are going to be using uh, oil and gas well into the future. And when the United States produces it and extracts it and refines it, it is the, the cleanest processes in the world. And the more we offshore those production and refining processes to other countries, the worse off we're going to be both economically and environmentally and from a climate standpoint, too. So the administration should be working with Congress to, to build back policy that actually opens access and creates a, a true all-of-the-above approach to energy. But the Biden administration doesn't seem to have the political will to do that, do they? It, it's very frustrating. You know, I, I, it seems as if some plan compromise could be made right now because energy security is of concern to Americans, and obviously the high prices at the pump are of paramount concern to Americans. Now is the time uh, that we should be working together, uh, and it's frustrating to see that there, there really is no legislative uh, offer on the table that the Biden administration is willing to take in uh, when it seems as if, you know, the at least the intermediate term, uh, answer is is right there in front of us continue to be the world's largest oil and gas producer uh, and while we can't do any nice to necessarily flip the switch and, and get gas prices down to two dollars per gallon there are a number of policy solutions that Americans want to see that Congress and the administration should be taking action on Nick here's a question that we were banding about a little bit earlier this morning and, and really haven't found a satisfactory answer to it why did we get to a point in in policy or in in some other way uh, that we said, all right, we've gone as far as we can go with carbon-based fuels. They can't get any cleaner. We're going to stop completely researching uh, better ways to burn it, better ways to use it, uh, more clean ways to use it, and we're going to go in an entirely different direction. Why did we decide that that was as far as we could go with carbon-based fuels? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if that's the best answer for you, but I do think those investments and innovations are happening. Uh, there's a, a power plant down in Texas that j- is burning natural gas with zero emissions. Uh, and so I do think that there are companies out there who are looking for ways to continue to make investment and innovation in carbon-based fuels and use that is cleaner, that continues to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, yet it doesn't get as much attention as switching to renewable energy or switching to electric vehicles. And I think that's what needs to be part of the process is because oil and gas are going to be consumed not just in the United States, but globally well into our future. It's those investments uh, and making sure we have the ability to permit and build those technologies because the innovation is one thing, but to deploy them is a whole other obstacle because it takes so long to do an environmental review, and conduct the permitting process. And then even if that's done, it's held up for years in litigation. There's so much regulatory morass that obstructs this investment that that's really where policymakers should be focused. And I think that there's left of center and right of center recognition that this is a huge, huge problem. And so is carbon always going to be a swear word now? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think so because of the, the, I think, What happened with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the price increases that we've seen today, and that the recognition for energy security, uh, now is the time to recognize that carbon-based fuels um, are going to be, you know, critical to 
American energy security, and I think they can be critical critical to both economic and environmental solutions moving forward. They need to be brought into the discussion more rather than, than just left out in the cold because, you know, we're not going to switch to an all-renewable future anytime soon if we do with uh, disregarding fossil fuels, disregarding nuclear. Uh, it's going to come at immense cost. Um, and and it's going to compromise American energy security. Nick Loris with us here this morning on Indiana in the Morning. Nick, tell me about C3 Solutions. Yeah, C3 Solutions is uh, the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. We're about two years old and a public policy shop uh, that recognizes the, the need that Americans want and desire uh, affordable, reliable energy, uh, but we're also working to address uh, our greatest environmental challenges as well. Well, we're going to learn more about it by going where? Uh, please check us out at, at c3solutions.org. We also have a, a news magazine where we highlight uh, a number of innovative American energy companies and agricultural companies uh, and environmental companies at c3newsmag.com, and we have a lot of commentary on public policy there as well. Working hard to make carbon no longer a curse word. He's Nick Lawrence. That's right. <laughs> Nick, thanks for spending some time with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It is the voice of Indiana County, WCCS, 101.1 FM and AM 1160 and AM 1160.